Well, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we can be in worship together, for this time that we can hear of your word. We pray, Lord, that that your spirit would be here and that these words would not be mine. They would be yours and they'd be words that convict us and impact us in mighty ways. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, my wife was a teacher for many years, and one of the fun things about marrying a teacher's uh, a teacher is that you get all of the crazy excuses for why kids don't bring their homework. And, and so you have things like, "Well, my mom didn't put it in the bag." Yeah, or, or you have the excuse of, "Well, last night I had taekwondo practice, and we had piano lessons, and then we went to my favorite restaurant, and then I got home, and it was my favorite show on TV." bad excuse, right? Uh, You have the whole thing of, this is actually true, the tooth fairy came and not only took my tooth, but my my homework too. (laughs) And then the classic, my dog ate it. But then, uh, this was great. No, really, my brother fed it to the dog, right? (laughs) Excuses. Well, Well, this morning we continue our series on where we're talking about all in. And we're talking about what God asks of us as his people. And he doesn't want just a slice of us. He doesn't want us just to dip a toe in. He wants us to jump in. He wants us to be all in. And so let's jump into God's word. If you've got a Bible, pull it out. And we're going to turn to Mark chapter 12. If you've got a smartphone, you can head to the website on the screen where you can follow along, take notes, interact a whole other way. You're turning quick, I know, but here, we're going to jump right in. Uh, Verse 28, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. And noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus said, the most important one is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The greatest commandment is to love God, to trust God, to be devoted to God completely, totally, to be all in. And that's what the series is all about. For almost a decade, I was a youth minister. And that meant I did a lot of crazy, stupid things to, uh, to really be able to get kids to be in a moment or in a, a teachable moment so that they would get formed and follow Jesus as a faithful follower of Jesus. And so we would do all kinds of things, especially to try to get them out of their comfort zone. So we would do things like go on mission trips. We did a lot of mission trips. We would take them certain places and they would do uh, challenge courses. And I remember, I think it was the very first challenge course because the, the group was really young. All right? And, and we were going through all these challenges and they were just fine and everything. And we get to the very last one. And it's a trust fall. Anybody know what a trust fall is? This is a platform, three, four feet off the ground, where you climb up, you know, you get on this thing, your whole group is behind you with their arms hanging out like this, and you, with your back to them, fall and they catch you. All right, you have to be all in if you're going to do a trust fall. Because if you're not, and you go behind first, your behind's going to get hurt. It is. It's going to go straight through because that 90-pound freshman girl is not going to be able to catch it. Uh, all right? And, and yet, you know, I, so the group's there and nobody wants to go. I'm like, well, I, I should be a good leader. I, I should go first. And, and let me tell you, I am not a 90-pound freshman girl. I am 6'3", 200, and yeah, quite a bit more. Yeah. And so I'm looking at my group and I'm thinking, okay, If I'm not all in, I'm surely going to have a sore behind. If I am all in, I might have a sore noggin, right? But supposedly, technically, if I do this right, they will catch me, all right? So I'm up there, and I am praying. I am shaking, and I'm like, dear Lord, please help these wimpy little tiny kids have superhuman strength, and I want. And they caught me. It's so hard to be all in, isn't it? Well, last week we talked about how it's hard to be all in with our heart, our soul, our might, our wallet. Because all of a sudden we have all these fears that come up in our mind that, that we're, we're scared about. And yet we talked about how God is the one that gives us all those things in the first place. 
He's the one that has given us our life and our talents and our gifts and our relationships and our abilities and the strength that we have. And he warns in Deuteronomy, hey, don't start thinking in your heart that it's all on you (laughs) because it's not. It's all about me. And so he asks us to be all in so that we realize that, so we're confident in that, so we, we understand that it all comes from him in the first place. This week, we're going to be talking about the second hurdle of being all in. Not only are we fearful, but all of a sudden, our mind starts racing and we start to make excuses. Excuses why we haven't and excuses why we shouldn't. Well, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As you turn there, uh, know that this is the second letter that, that Paul has written to the church in Corinth. The first letter, 1 Corinthians, was a letter that he wrote to them to help them to understand that they were dealing with these issues and tiffs and, 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 and these struggles because their past and their culture was influencing their present walk with Jesus Christ. All right? So that was what 1 Corinthians was about. 2 Corinthians is about the fact that all of those issues have stormed back, and yet this time they are armed with all kinds of excuses to rationalize them away. And so Paul is coming back through and going through some of those same issues again and trying to dig in deep and help them understand this. Look at verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And so Paul says, when it comes to being all in with our our stuff, when it comes to trusting God and giving back to God, there comes a time where you have to decide. There comes this time where we actually get kind of on that platform, like the trust fall, and we got to decide if we're all in, if we're going to trust. And yet that's hard. And typically when we start making that kind of a decision, we do it with the whole, with totally wrong presuppositions which results in not cheerful giving, which results in something far from being all in and nothing much really of substance. See, some people give to God as a tip. They really do. They treat their giving back to God uh, as as a tip for his services rendered. So if, if he has done a great job, you know, he's been attentive God and shown up over and above our expectations, then we give him a little better tip. (laughs) But if he hasn't been all that mighty and powerful and active in our life, in our perspective, then all of a sudden we might cut back or we'll stiff him. You know, and the problem with this mentality is it flows into this consumeristic view that so many people have of the church, where they come in a a church doors and they treat their church choice kind of like they treat their restaurant choice that you might be going to in a little bit for lunch. I mean, think about it. You go to a restaurant, and you sit down, and and they do everything for you. They come, and they bring you your water and your bread. They come and give you your burger and beer and your your steak and wine or whatever you like, right? And you sit there, and you kind of wait for them to serve you. Now, I like Mexican restaurants. So I value my, I, I judge a Mexican restaurant on the quantity and the quality of chips and salsa. Anybody else there? Yeah? All right. And it's got to be good chips. And it's got to be good salsa. And, and here's the kicker. When it's empty, and it will be empty, it's me. I'm not a 90-pound freshman girl. And when it's empty, <laughs> sorry, uh, then I want it filled. I mean, they said, all you can eat, chips and salsa, right? All right. For you, maybe it's on how the service is, or maybe it's on uh, how your steak is cooked, or how salty your soup is, or, or whatever, whatever it is. And if it's not right, you ask for a comment card, right? And that's your right. But the problem is, is that sometimes we do the same with the church or with God. And so as the service goes, then the tip goes. So the better the service, the more attentive the care, the better the tip. And yet the problem with that is that perspective turns everything upside down. 
everything upside down as far as what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And it opens this door for a plethora of excuses of not being all in. Now, other people, they don't give as a tip. They give as a tax. And so they don't give out of a desire to give. They give out of compulsion and fear and demand. They see it as a tax, as a law, as this thumb that's pushing down on them. Now, I would assume that, that many of us in here, maybe not everybody, may, many of us don't necessarily like to always pay our tax, right? Maybe more or less versus this week versus last week. I don't know. We won't go there. But anyway, I, some of us may really not like it. Some of us may really kind of play a game on how to get out of much tax as possible. You look for the exemptions and, and the exceptions and the write-offs and so on and so forth. When we start treating our, our giving as a tax, we start going into that mindset. And then all of a sudden we start looking for things to deduct, like mileage to church. Somebody's laughing about that. No. Or, or the fact that, you know, I, I brought a dinner to my neighbor. I, I'll keep that receipt. Or I handed out <laughs> candy to my neighbors when they came for trick-or-treat. Or... I mean, it goes on and on. Or how many hours did I, I serve at, at church? I can deduct that off of my tithe. And, and then it doesn't, it, it's not about what I can do. It's about what's the least that I can do. I mean, bottom line, God, between you and me, what's the least I can pay for us to be good? And Paul said, no. Give out of thankfulness. Don't give so that God loves you. That doesn't work that way. Don't give as a tip to God. Don't give to pay God off. No, give out of thankfulness, out of this pure, overwhelming, outlandish reaction to what God has given you, his grace he's given you, and everything else that he has given you. Keep your finger in 2 Corinthians, but then go to Luke, and we're going to thumb through here just a bit. We'll start at Luke chapter 5. In Luke 5, we see this guy, Levi. We meet him. He is a tax collector. Tax collector means he wasn't so honest. He ripped people off sometimes. I'm not saying anything about today. All right? This was back then. Tax collector. And so Jesus told him about, about faith and forgiveness and grace, and it impacted him so much that he went and he threw this big old party for all his friends so that they would meet Jesus. And do you know what he did right after that? He left it all. And he walked and he followed Jesus wherever he went. Levi's name is Matthew. You go to Luke 7. And all of a sudden we see that Jesus is in this meal with, with people of clout. And in comes this woman that was known as a sinful woman. She was probably known for being a bit loose, if you know what I mean. And yet she had met Jesus and heard Jesus and heard the forgiveness and the grace that Jesus gave to her in a new life, a new start. And so she comes into this meal because she is so excited about this. And she has this full jar of alabaster, alabaster jar full of perfume and pours it on Jesus' feet. Cost her a fortune, but she didn't care. You turn the page and you go to Luke 17. You see that one of the ten come back to Jesus. Risks everything to thank him for, for healing him and throws, him in, and throws himself at him in devotion and follows him as a faithful follower. You, you turn the page to, to Luke 19, and, and we find this, this little guy up in a tree, <laughs> and, and he is searching for Jesus. His name's Zacchaeus, and yet Jesus was looking for him. And out of this reaction, this, this tyrant of a man who had said he was wealthy, and he was wealthy not because he was honest, he was wealthy because he ripped people off. Out of his reaction to that grace and that forgiveness, he says, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. You go to Luke 21 and you find the, the, the widow, the poor widow who puts two coins into the, to the offering. And it doesn't look like much, but it's everything to her, almost everything 
But that's her reaction to what God has given to her. You turn to Acts, Acts chapter 4, and you see that this church, as it takes off, these people that lives are transformed by the Holy Spirit, and they, out of grace, they give everything. What's mine is yours, so that nobody's in need, so nobody is at want. Every single time, the story's the same. Grace is given, lives are changed, and the response is this reaction of gratitude for what God has given to them. So the question is, what about you? I mean, sorry, but you're messed up. You are. I know. I mean, I may not know exactly how you're messed up, but if you're anything like me, you are messed up. We all walk around with with huge pasts that haunt us. We have junk in our lives. And yet we have a Savior who looks at us and says, I still love you. My grace is sufficient for you. I tasted death so that you can taste life in my name. So the things you've done, the words you said, forgiven. The guilt you hold on, the the stuff that turns your stomach, (laughs) released. The things that trap you and entangle you, reconciled. Your past, wiped away. And if you... (laughs) And if you've tasted that grace, if you know what it means to hear those words, I love you, I still accept you, I forgive you, I free you, what does that do in you? How does it impact you? How do you react to that? Quite honestly and sadly, Probably a lot of us, over time, slowly move back to our old, selfish kind of ways, don't we? And we don't necessarily internalize that, and we don't necessarily react to that. But that is one of the reasons why God asks us to be all in, to give back, to show our trust in him, to rely on him to completely trust that he's going to continue to provide for us. Turn back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 8 this time. So I share with you that these people, they were struggling with some of this stuff. And so this is what he says in verse 7. He says, but since you, the church in Corinth, you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in love, we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Yeah, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Paul echoes themes of of other letters like Ephesians 2 where it says, you know, you are not saved by by the good things that you do, by being nice, by, by giving back or whatever. No, you are saved by grace alone. You are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. But what does that do in you? I mean, that should be like winning the sweepstakes. That should be like winning the lottery or something. You can't just then go and turn into business as usual. You have the greatest news of the world. So how are you going to react? Well, Trunk or Treat was just over, and uh, Trunk or Treat, Trick or Treat, whatever, all those things were over. And so in my house, we have three buckets that are full of candy. I have three kids. And and so um, that means we, for the next three months, don't have to buy any treats for dinner. It's great. It's awesome. So here's the deal. If they eat a good dinner, then my kids, they get a piece or two of candy afterwards. But that means then there's this great opportunity for my kids to really test the boundaries of what constitutes eating a good dinner. You know what I'm saying? Uh, 
And the reality is we aren't all that different than that. I mean, we may not be five or seven, but we still struggle with boundaries. We want to know the boundaries. We want to know the definition. We want to know what, what's expected. And God says that, that this is not a law. God says that this does not determine if you're saved or if you're loved. But he makes the boundaries clear. He says, how about I give you everything and you live on 90% and you entrust 10% back to me and we'll call that a tithe. Now, I know, I know, I can even see it in a few of you guys. We're all of a sudden like, whoa, talk about my heart sinking. That's freaking me out. Kidding me. And our, our, our minds go and we make up all kinds of excuses and yet that's what God asks of us. Not, not to be mean, not because he's poor or anything like that, but because he knows what's best for us. He knows that we need to have that connection and that trust and, and to be able to remember that it all comes from him and we are totally dependent on him. And yet Barna, well, published, um, documented uh, a company of research has, has found out that for Christians, this whole money thing is a place where there is a ton of questions and we struggle with it. In fact, they found out that the average Christian gives 2% of their income, 2%. And so that means here in Little Rock, in this area right here, our average, our median income is about $65,000 for a family. 2% of that is $1,300. I know lots of people who go to get coffee and they spend more than $1,300 for a year. I know lots of people who do, you know, have cable and it's well more than $1,300 a year. And my point is not to, to, to talk down on that stuff. I'm just saying that if what we give back to God is equal to what we give to Starbucks or to Comcast, it says a lot about our priorities. And so our number one excuse for giving back to God and not giving back to God is that we can't afford it. And yet that's not really true, is it? We've just made some decisions that make it difficult and painful to do. Being all in is, is about you. It's about your relationship with God, your dependence, your gratitude, your reaction to what God has done for you. And I'd be lying, and I'd be, I'd be holding back if I didn't share this, this story of my life. Fifteen years ago, when my wife and I were just married, we struggled with this. We had all kinds of excuses. She was a, a Christian teacher. I was a Christian youth minister. And, and we had all these excuses and struggles. We had this you know, struggle that, okay, we're going to give to the church, and they're going to pay us back. That's our salary. That's weird, so that should be some kind of deduction. Our, our salaries were really pitiful back then. That should be a deduction. Uh, we had this whole, I think, you know, people called us on our day off. That's a deduction. You know, it wasn't in the budget, all the things that we needed for the things that we did, and we had to go out and buy it, so that should be a deduction. Uh, we didn't agree with some of the decisions of the church that we were in. That's a deduction. You see where this goes? And yet, Andrea and I... <laughs> We, we, we struggled with this and we had such guilt at this that we actually tracked. We tracked what we should have given versus what we gave. So three or so years later, when we moved from that church, in our hearts and our mind, we, we felt guilty about leaving that church owing it almost $2,000. Talking to somebody after first service and they said, you know what, we, we struggled with that for years too. We played all these games and all these excuses, and we had so much guilt that was, that was associated with that that finally we just had to say, forget it. Just got to jump all in. My prayer for you is that this, this series, no matter where you're at, maybe you've never given before, maybe you've given the national average, maybe you've given more, but that the series gives you an opportunity to shed the guilt from the past. Just leave that behind. But also to shed the excuses for the future. One of the reasons we're doing this campaign, not only is it very strategic to, to help us as a congregation go forward, as a ministry go forward, but also so that you get a very visible, very, you can give something 
and grow in your giving in a significant way and see that happen right in front of you. So maybe this is an opportunity for you to give for the very first time. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to to go from 2% to 5%. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to to reach a tithe. Maybe it's an opportunity for the very first time to to give over, over and above a tithe. I don't know. It was about a year ago, and Wynn, who's, who's here, he was uh, part of the, the call committee, head of the call committee, and, and he and a group, they called, called me on the phone, and they asked me uh, about if I'd be interested in being a pastor, and they interviewed me for an hour. Right after that, I took my, my son to the emergency room, uh, so I didn't think much of it. He had cut his foot, and he had to get stitches and all that stuff, but a month later, they called me back, and they said they're going to bring my name to, to the voters to call. I was shocked. I really was. Ten months ago, um, Andrea and I were in the car in Houston, uh, headed to the airport, and we were going to fly here, and we didn't know why. We didn't. And yet, as that weekend unveiled, all of a sudden we started to see. We went home, and we prayed for a couple of weeks and really sought what God wanted us to do, and it became super clear. See, I I know the last decade or so has been tough here. I know. But God has set us up to do some amazing things. You know, when I look at the people that are here, when I got to meet them 10 months, you, 10 months ago, when I looked at our facility and our land and our location here in the middle of Little Rock, I see that the sky is the limit of what God can do in our midst and through us. I I live my life by many of the plans of a man's heart, but it's the will of the Lord that prevails. And I I believe that. And and I know this church is not my church. It's not your church. It's God's church. But when I look out, when I see, I see all kinds of opportunities. I see opportunity to to build onto this facility right here so that we have a a large commons fellowship area where people can intermingle and and, and share coffee and and get to know each other. I see the possibility with with young professionals moving in this area for us to add on to the school and have up to code a preschool where we can reach uh, these these young families and that's a huge feeder that goes into the rest of our school. I I see a day when, when this place is full and we need more space. And we've got the land to do it where we can put a new worship facility on this land, where we can use this land in an intentional way to reach this community and the needs of this community through hike and bike and parks. I see the possibility someday of coming along with LCEF and and, and purchasing Lou High, the old Lou High building. Whether it's a high school or at least a junior high there, if there's youth ministry there, if we use it as a community center, uh, for, for all ages or senior citizens in this area that we could use that for and be a, an outreach for those people. I, I could go on. And I don't know what God wants to do, but all I know is that I'm excited to partner with you and see where God leads and see where he wants us to be faithful and go. Today, um, At noon, we're going to have a a town hall meeting here where we're going to talk a little more about that vision, where we're going to talk about how this this campaign is is a strategic step towards opening the door for a vision of whatever God wants to lead. Uh, I I hope you'll come and ask your questions. But next week, I want to ask you to make some kind of commitment to this campaign. Uh, And as you struggle with that, as you struggle with your commitment to this campaign, as you struggle with, with just the fact of giving back to God and trusting in that and going through all of those, uh, those, those excuses and the fears that might come with that, uh, I want to challenge you to, to really pray about how you're going to react to a God that is good, a God that loves you, a God that has blessed you in so many ways, and answer this question. How are you going to love God with your heart, your mind, and your tangible things? And as you do that, think of these four things, all right? Think about um, making it proportionate 
So whatever it is, make it proportionate. If that's 2%, if that's 5% on the way up towards the top, whatever it is, make it proportionate. Because as God blesses you, you should give back. Okay, secondly, make it first. Do it out of trust. Thirdly, be, um, be honest. Oh, I guess second was be honest. Sorry, I should look at my notes right there. Um, but be honest. So don't play games with God. Thirdly, make it first. And lastly, be consistent. Make it a discipline. But don't give back to God as a tip or as a tax. Give out of thankfulness. Give out of gratitude for the grace that he's given you and the gifts that he's given you all around you. Because he's good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for each and every one of us in this room. I know this is one of those topics that, that can be very difficult and tough. It can, it can cause guilt in our lives. It can and bring up all kinds of excuses in our life. And yet I know it's that last piece for so many of us that we want to just hold on to. I pray, Lord, that you would open the door of, of our mind and of our heart to see how you bless us in immense ways. That you would help us to see how we can be good stewards by giving back and trusting in you and be relying and be dependent upon you. I pray as a ministry, Lord, that you would help us as we all go in to, to be faithful to whatever you lead us. However big, however small, it's not about us, it's about you. It's not about our glory, it's not about our name, it's about your kingdom. Help us keep that in focus every single day. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.